All right, everybody. It's the Always Be Cool podcast, hanging out with your hosts, Bobby Kerr and Darren Copeland. What's up, everybody? We've got a really, really special guest today. DC is about to do his usual introduction, but man, we are just super, super excited today to have the living Kansas City Chiefs legend and just a phenomenal ph- philanthropist here in Kansas City, Mr. Duran Cherry. All right, guys, here we go. Born September 12, 1959 from Riverside, New Jersey, played football at Rutgers University, played with the Kansas City Chiefs from 1981 to 1991, six-time Pro Bowl selection from 1983 to 88. Wow. He is regarded as one of the best free safeties to ever play the game, only one of 26 players of all time to have at least 50 or more interceptions. In 1998, he won the Wizard White NFL Man of the Year Award. He's on the NFL 1980s All-Decade Team, Kansas City Chiefs Hall of Famer. His Duran Cherry Foundation supports several great causes, Score One for Health, Camp Quality, Midwest Animal Rescue, and Answering the Call. Chiefs legend and all-around awesome guy, Duran Cherry. Welcome to the yeah, show, man. It's guys, great to have you here. Thanks for having me, man. This right. is cool. I, I enjoy these podcasts and uh, love the idea of talking and, um, and just meeting new people and, and new experiences. So this is fun. I'm, I'm I'm grateful that you guys asked me to come on. Well, Absolutely. We're, we're grateful yeah. to have you, and we were just discussing before we started recording that you know, we've got lots of people in our lives that – kind of bring us all together and that seems to happen a lot of times with our guests is some you know we yeah. know three or four people together so that's a that's a ton of fun so well, that, that's why we always have to be cool bobby because it's a very small world <laughs> yeah, and yeah. you just never Kansas know City is a small town it everybody really knows is. everybody and it's it's funny i was down at the lake you were talking about jamie and yeah her husband you know meeting them because our daughters go to ninja warriors together and uh, she brought up your name and you know, it's just amazing how the connections right. work, and now she's helping me try to get a vehicle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Try, it's been hard right. to get a car, yeah. right, under right. the circus. So she's been helping me with that, and it's just uh, it's just amazing that the people that you meet and, and how interconnected we all are, right. uh, especially here in Kansas City. Even though it's a fairly good-sized city, it's still small. Absolutely. Well, so I'm, everybody knows each other. It, it, it's literally like the smallest big town yeah. you could come yeah. across, right? It's, it's wonderful. I, I enjoy living here, raising my family here. It's just a, just a wonderful place. I tell people when I travel all over the country, I say, Kansas City is the best-kept secret, you know. Well, I don't want to live in a small city. I'm like, well, don't come here. <laughs> right. We're fine. We're okay. Right. right. I know. It will, a lot of the guys, you know, that we have on the show, a lot of former Royals players, predominantly, because that's our kind of our sphere is the Royals guys, and they all at some point were pretty much tra- transplants from right. other cities. Mm-hmm. They came here to play professional sports. And then they just stayed and never left. Mm-hmm. And they say the same thing. It's, it was yeah. the best kept secret. Why would I ever leave? This community embraced me and my family with love and open arms even after my career ended. That's special because that doesn't really happen everywhere else. I don't well, think. exactly. And the, and the thing is, it's not like we live on the beach or water here in Kansas City, <laughs> right? But it's amazing the amount of people that, that hang around. Yeah, it is. And, you know, the good thing about Kansas City, it is centrally located. So mm-hmm. if you need to get to the beach mm-hmm. or the ocean or a lake or something like that, you, it, it's pretty close by. And you can still enjoy those things, um, you know, just because you're, you're centrally located in the middle of the country. And it's, it's just great. It's great to raise a family here. Right. You know, the yep. cost of living is good. And I think, you know, a lot of guys, you know, they want to make sure that their hard-earned money, you know, stays with them longer. Right. Right? So a lot of them, that's why they stay here because some other places you go to and it's just like, wow, how expensive is this? It's crazy. It's crazy. The quality of life here is just amazing. Yeah, and the food's not too bad too, right? I'm a barbecue guy. Heck yeah. Right, right. There's another place in in this country that you know and i argue with people all the time and until you come to kansas city and eat that barbecue you right. don't know how good it is it's true that's <laughs> true well you, you like, talk about you know staying here and 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 really embedding yourself in a community i mean obviously we'll talk a lot about your time with the chiefs but for you to kind of make that transition into to business right from football like it feels like you were really thinking post football even in the middle or even in the beginning of your career to say I'm not going to do this forever because I think I'm assuming right and a lot of professional athletes don't really think about that Mm -hmm. especially in the middle of their career so like what was it that made something click for you to be like this is where I want to be I want to embed myself in 
not only the community but with business and, and to say yeah. I'm ready to, to focus on something else. Well, in our sport, guys, as you know, you're only one play away from your career being over. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always uh, thought about that because I'd always see guys that get injured or get hurt or guys that came before me that, um, you know, had a career-ending injury and they didn't have anything else to fall back on. Right. So, you know, if you're looking at those situations and you're not learning from them, then shame on you. Mm -hmm. And so I always understood that I'm I'm one play away from not playing this sport anymore. And I'm one play away from having my life change instantly. Mm. And I always wanted to be prepared. So during the off seasons and even during the seasons, I would, you know, do internships. If I was interested in something, I'd go talk to somebody really? that was in that, mm -hmm. in that field and just try to build my network up so that when I got done playing, at least I had a list of names of people I could go see and go talk and get gather information on what I wanted to do. And uh, it was actually a friend of mine, a banker, that came to me and said, hey, you know, here's an opportunity. You know, call this guy and see if he's interested in maybe partnering with you. And um, so I did, and uh, the guy kind of cussed me out and said, no, I'm not willing to take on any partners and not willing to sell. And, <laughs> right. and then a couple of weeks after that or a month or so, you know, the uh, anheuser Bush wound up terminating the guy and taking away his distributorship. Mm. Oh, wow. And then it kind of opened up the door. But, you know, I had been laying the groundwork and, and doing the things to put me in a position where I could take advantage of an opportunity when it came up. So um, always thinking about my last play, you know, could it be over, you know, and, you know, 1989, the wake-up call came when um, playing against the San Diego Chargers in Arrowhead Stadium next to the last game of the season, and um, there was a play. Neil Smith mm. got fooled on the reverse, double-backed. I came up to make the tackle on the guy, and he dove to try to, to catch him. The guy ducks down. <laughs> Neil hits me, and, and I didn't know he had hit me until right. I saw the film. Mm -hmm. Hits me in my knee, and uh, then I tear my uh, ACL. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're sitting there, and you're walking off that field. I got up, walked off the field, but I knew it, something wasn't right. And then when I went down the tunnel, because they wanted to check me out inside, my knee kind of flew open. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh no. Like, okay, uh, <laughs> something definitely is not right here, and. Right. And the doctor told me, he said, I think you probably tore your ACL. So Right. Um, that was a wake-up call. You know, even though I was planning, it was still a wake-up call because then the reality sets in. Now you're saying, God, now i got to work my butt off to get back. And I didn't mind working. Working was okay with me. Uh, but it's still a setback. It's an mm -hmm. adverse situation. Now mm -hmm. you got to deal with it mentally because – you go in, you get in an operation, and you come out of the operation, and your leg is four times the size, your knee is four Jeez. times the size wow. of your leg, and you're sitting there, and then all of a sudden reality hits in. It's like, man, it, is it ever going to get back to being normal, right? right? right. So you feel all that anxiety, and you want to, you want it to go away quickly, but you know it's going to be a process. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was ten months process. Uh, you know, the doctor said, maybe a year and a half. And I said, no, it's not going to take me a year and a half to get <laughs> back. I'm going to work my butt off. And I did, mm -hmm. you know, every day, sometimes three times a day, I was in rehab just trying to get back. And I was able to get back on the field in 10 months. And that was uh, – I could have got back sooner, but because of the league rules when you're on the, the, pup. P, the yeah. pup list, oh, you, right. you got to sit out the first six games. So, um, But, you know, it's um, it's a – it was a learning experience for me, you know, to be able to go through that adversity because then you find out about yourself and what you're made of, how hard it takes to work to get back, and you never take it for granted because I, I saw guys that couldn't recover from that surgery because of the, the pain level, mm -hmm. the rehab that it took, and, um, you know, technology has changed. I mean, had it been three or four years earlier, that injury, you know, it might have been career You've been ended. done. Yeah. Yeah. It been done, so... I'm thankful and blessed that, um, you know, technology was as such that, you know, now they be, 
they're, they're just routine. You know you can come back from an injury like that. Mm -hmm. And I think about all the guys that came before me that had that injury and their careers were over and didn't have an opportunity to come right. back, you know. And right. so really felt blessed to have that opportunity. And then you, you just want to take advantage of it and learn from it. But it did open up my eyes to the fact that, you know, I got to be thinking about, you know, what am I going to do once my career is over, right. you know, because you don't, you don't have too many opportunities. And when you, when you, when you have those opportunities, especially while you're playing, you got to really take it serious and, and take advantage of it. Well, and, and also, you know, you were, you did a fantastic job planning ahead, right? While you're working mm -hmm. and thinking about ahead, but you know, it's not only so much the physical injury, you know, of the knee, but you know, I, I think a lot of the guys, it's the mental part mm. of trusting that knee and whether you're going to be able to rely on that again, right? Oh, yeah. I, 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 it, it was weird coming back because you don't know, and especially when I was coming back the week that I was going to come back, um, you know, you're all anxious because we were getting ready to play the Raiders that week, and it was my first game back and Bo Jackson's first game back mm. in baseball <laughs> with the Royals, right? Yeah. And so that week of practice, we're out there practicing and everything. And we're, if you know, remember Marty, Marty Schottenheimer. Mm -hmm. and That's Raiders week. Yeah, it's Raiders <laughs> week. And you're almost like playing a game that week before because he's, he's still, he you know, had those physical practices, right? You know, now these practices are, are nothing. You know, you, they're not going to beat your mm -hmm. body up. Marty didn't care about that. He was like, <laughs> you know, right. we're going to be physical. So we, you know, you have a team period and, you know, you're basically going full speed. And I remember Christian coming through the hole and I come up there and hit him. And he go, why you hit me like that, Mon? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Christian, you the biggest thing out here, man. Um, you know, with all his pads on and everything. He was so big. He was 300 pounds. Was he him, really? I had him step on the scale before a game in the locker room. We had this big scale. I said, Christian, step up there, man. He had all his equipment on. He was 300 pounds. Dude, his pads looked like they yeah. like went above his helmet. Like They, they were, were massive. So big. Yeah, so I'm going like, man, if I get, if my knee can hold up hitting you, then I know mm. I'm ready to go. And he looks at me and goes, okay, Mom. I understand. <laughs> so, but, yeah, it's, um, you know, you're, you're always apprehensive. You sure. Because uh, you don't know if it's stable, but. You know, I put in the work, and so I felt really confident that, you know, I could, you know, come back and and not have to worry about it. I did wear a brace when I came back the first – that first remainder of that season and last year. I went in and got it cleaned up because I had a bunch of uh, mm -hmm. arthritis in it, got it cleaned up, and then I was fine the next year. didn't have to wear a brace, and it, it was fine and never affected me after that. So. Right. Well, right. Well, Link, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I, I was going to actually take it back a little bit to the early Duran Cherry days of, you know, coming out of college, mm -hmm. right, uh, undrafted. So you were no stranger to having to put in the hard work, right. have, having to prove yourself. Diversity, so, yeah. you know, you know, we're starting to find ourselves being older a little bit. Not everyone knows all the stories, but share with some of the listeners, like, you know, how that path started, you know, when you got out of, uh, out of college how you got with the Chiefs because you actually were a really good punter. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I was a good punter at Rutgers. Um, and actually, you know, Ted Cottrell, uh, who was our linebacker coach um, when I came to Kansas City, but he was also my coach at Rutgers. He was the defense coordinator at Rutgers and then took a job with Marv Levy mm. um, at the time and to, for his, to be his linebacker coach. And so I was uh, – you know, Ted had called me during the draft that year and said, hey, we, we, we may draft you in the later rounds. If not, would you be interested in signing with us as a free agent? We're looking for a punter. We're also looking at safeties, too, and I played safety in college. Mm -hmm. And so it just happened that right after the second day of the draft, I, didn't, I wasn't going to get drafted, which I was okay with because I had a bunch of teams call me saying, hey, we want to sign you as a free agent. So literally you could pick and choose where mm -hmm. you wanted to go. And mm -hmm. it just happened that Kansas City – they were looking for punters. They were looking for safeties, and that was two positions that I could play. And so I took a chance and came out here. And um, at the time, Frank Yance was the special teams coach. Frank Gantz. Frank. There's a blast. Yeah. Uh, the, the 
pretend <clears throat> fighter pilot is what I used to call him. Yep. You know, Frank used to tell us all these fighter pilot stories, and then we found out that he wasn't, wasn't a fighter, real. A fighter pilot, but <laughs> he told good stories, right? You know? So, but uh, it was, um, you know, they they brought me in, and you know, he wanted to change my punting style. And if you know that, when you've been punting a certain mm-hmm. way all your life and never had a punt blocked, and you know, you're averaging over 40-some yards of punt, and now all of a sudden they want to change you. It's just like, oh, this is crazy. So I remember getting my letter to report back to camp like two days before training camp started, and they told me I was going to come back in like two weeks before training camp. Okay. So, you know, you're sitting there looking, and you know the handwriting's on the wall. So if I'm coming in two days before camp, mm-hmm. they're mm-hmm. going to give me a little bit of shot, and then they're going to just release me. So – I was, uh, I remember this because uh, I was in my mom's bedroom and I remember when I was opening up that letter and reading and going like, shoot, what do I do, you know? And so I picked up the phone and I called Kansas City and talked to Coach Levy and said, hey, Coach, I know my punting is not what it should be, but, you know, Coach Gantz is trying to change me into a two-step punter and I never had a punt blocked in college and I can get the ball off quick. And... Um, but I can also play safety, I can play cornerback, I can play quarterback. <laughs> so there's a lot of different positions. Would you give me an opportunity to come back in and, and work out at the safety position? Because they had drafted three safeties that year. Lloyd Burris was one Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. Lloyd Burris. And yeah. then they had two other guys, I think one in the fifth round and another one in the seventh round. And both of those guys had played in college all-star games. And I was watching them at mini camp and I'm going like man I'm just as good as those guys <laughs> and so I asked coach Levy hey will you give me an opportunity to come in and work at the safety position and and still do some punting and stuff like that and he uh he said let me get back to you so I don't know who he talked to or whatever happened he calls me back about 45 minutes later and says okay we'll bring you in and and so I I came in and basically all I did was play the safety position during training camp, you know, and I still punted, you know, in special teams period, but punting was going to be, you know, the thing that I was going to do right. considering mm-hmm. Coach Gantz didn't, you know, he wanted a two-step punter. Um, but um, Coach Coach Levy gave me a chance. I mean, had I not made that phone call, my life would have been different. Absolutely. Um, right. And he gave me the opportunity to come back in, play safety, made it to um, – all the way through the preseason, at the end there were seven defensive backs, and mostly we had a 45-man roster then. So that's wow. that's usually the number seven. But the Chiefs had a unique situation. They had drafted two tight ends: Willie Scott in the first round, Marvin Harvey in the third round, and they had Ed Beckman, who was a special teams captain, and then Al Dixon was a starter from the previous year. Mm-hmm. Neither one of those other tight ends, the young guys, were ready to play. So I'm dressed. It's on a Monday. We're getting ready to go play Pittsburgh. It was uh, the opening game mm-hmm. in yeah. Pittsburgh. I was excited because I live in, grew up in New Jersey. Right. My dad and them, family could all come up and see me play. First professional game. And I'm ready to walk out to practice. And I said, hey, you need to go see Les Miller. He's a pro personnel guy. So oh, boy. I go see Les Miller, and I'm thinking, you know, he's going to tell you to bring your playbook. <laughs> well, no, he didn't tell me to bring That's... my playbook. They, I thought he was calling me up there to say, hey, congratulations on making the team. And I mean, literally, I'm dressed to go out on the field to yeah. practice. Right. And he goes, hey, you know, we, 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 uh, we got to make a move. Um, we're we're going to have to keep four tight ends, and nobody keeps four tight ends on their roster. Not with a 40-man, 45-man roster. And so they wind up keeping the four tight ends, and then they only kept six defensive backs going into that first game. Wow. And so they said, hey, we got to send you home. And I was I was upset because I knew I had played good enough to make the team. And uh, so I was like, okay. All right, so I went home, went uh, went back to Jersey. Uh, that weekend I went up to um, East Orange, New Jersey, because my college roommate lived up there, and so I went up there and spent the weekend with him and his family. And Sunday night my mom calls me and says, hey, I got a call from Kansas City. They got a 
plane ticket waiting for you at the airport in Philadelphia. They need you to come back out. Somebody, Here we go. Somebody really? got hurt. Oh, okay. So I rush home, pack up, get on the plane next day, get to Kansas City that evening. Uh, they drive me from the airport right to the stadium. I go upstairs to the general manager's office, Jim Schaff. God rest his soul, just passed away. Um, and uh, he goes, I'm sorry, but uh, the guy wasn't as hurt as we thought. Oh, my gosh. Seriously? Are you so serious? we're not going to be able to sign you. So Gary Green, who was a cornerback at the time. Oh, yeah. Teammate, and, you know, he had a two-bedroom apartment. He was from Texas. So he says, hey, you can come stay with me. Drive me to practice. You have my car. Use it. You can go to the gym, work out, go get your training done, and stuff like that. So I did that uh, for the first week, and then the Chiefs called me back in and said, hey, if, if nothing happens this next week, nobody gets hurt, we're going to have to send you home. So Because, you know, they weren't allowed to. So were you still kind of on the payroll right. then? Yeah. 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 Okay, I, that's what I'm right. picking up. All right. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Right. Unofficially. Well, they were giving me, yeah, so, yeah. you know, a little per diem and stuff like sure. that to keep me, hold me over, but they weren't paying me anything, you know, just enough to. Just so you wouldn't starve. Right. Just right. So I, wouldn't I don't starve, know that that happens so. in today's NFL. No. I, no. I don't think well, it's got that. Practice squad now. Right. Practice I don't think squad. it's that. That's true. Right. Yeah. But uh, so the next game they had three guys that got hurt. Two of them were on defense, and um, and then they signed me immediately. So, so Duran, so I, I just have to ask this question, man. So, were you watching the game, and like, if you saw someone got hurt, were you upset? Did you feel a little bit bad, or were you kind of happy? Yeah, well, I, I wasn't <laughs> happy because the first guy that got hurt that that game was Art Still. Oh, oh my gosh, and, yeah, no. still a good buddy. If Art and I are cousins, so really, yeah, I never so, knew that. Yeah, our family. Um, you know, there's a still side of the family that I grew up on. My great grandfather was a still. Wow. And so it, um, so we, we have known each other, I mean, all when I was growing up because my dad umpired baseball, basketball, and he used to take me, take me and my brothers down to, um, when he'd ref a game or umpire a game, but mainly when he was refereeing basketball because our, was a good basketball player. And he was a pretty tall guy, yeah, too. Yeah, he's tall. He's six, six, <laughs> yeah, seven, huge. Yeah. Six, seven. Hands so, the size of catcher mitts. <laughs> so his his high school team, I don't know if you remember Derek Ramsey, who was a quarterback at Kentucky and played for the Raiders tight yeah. end. Yeah. Art, Derek Ramsey, and there was another kid named Daryl Lee who played, I think Daryl played at the University of Florida. It was a big, he was like six six almost 280 pounds when he was in big high guy. school. Big guy. Jeez. That was their back line. And so in we high go, school. In high school. So we go watch him play. And, uh, you know, Art comes from a huge family. There's 11 kids in his family. And all of them are, um, you know, just all the boys. I don't think there's anybody that's under six foot three. Good night. And then the girls are, are tall. Matter of fact, his sister, Valerie, you know, Valerie is the all-time leading scorer in Kentucky basketball history. You're kidding. I didn't, wow. Yes. This is Art's wow. sister? Art's sister. No Well, no joke. wonder. I mean, so I've always seen him at every event you do. At mm-hmm. You know, he's yeah. part of so much. You know, He's yeah. been in my foursome at your golf mm-hmm. tournament yeah. a couple yeah. of times. Yeah, yeah. he's family. Yeah. Oh, he's yeah. family. He's that makes cousins. sense. Now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. He's so funny. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. One of the funniest guys I've ever met. He's hilarious. And, um you know, you just uh, – so, yeah, I was upset, you know, that he got hurt. But yeah. that kind of paved uh, the way. And then there was a linebacker we had from Hawaii, Frank Malu, Malu Maliuna. And, and Frank got hurt that game, too. Mm-hmm. So there was two guys on defense, so they wound up replacing – signing me that next week. And and then that was history. Wow. That's, that's when it all started for me. Right. Well, the, the idea – I think the theme here for the first 20 minutes is, you know – when people go through something or some type of adversity, right? It's not just, you know, oh shucks, that sucks. It didn't happen for me. I guess I'll move on to the next thing. You know, there there is something uh, about taking action, and really, you know, obviously, we're, you know, you're blessed. You know, yeah. I, we hate the word lucky, right? So yeah. a lot of us are blessed, but bad things happen sometimes, or things that we don't necessarily plan on. Right. So you making the phone call, right, from your mom's house. To say, hey, coach, you know, I, is there another opportunity for me to try out at a different position, not just punter? Mm-hmm. You know, that was, 
you taking action and literally changing the course of your entire life. Absolutely. Yeah. And I tell kids this all the time. You never know when a situation arises when you have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. You know, you're either going to be motivated to, to make that decision or you're going to sit there and say, nah, I'm not going to do it. Right. It's, you know, it's, that's it. And I tell kids all the time, you know, you're going to get to that point where you're at a crossroad. Mm -hmm. and you're right. gonna have to. You're gonna have to say, okay, what's important? You're gonna have to come out of your comfort zone. Mm. And for me, it was a big time coming out of the comfort zone, uh, picking up that phone and calling Coach Levy and saying, hey, give me, give me an opportunity. And uh, I'm so thankful and grateful to Coach Levy. And you know, just a story. When I retired um, my last year in '92, right before the '92 season announced my retirement and we did it at the stadium and uh, um, I remember afterwards going into the PR office and the guy says hey you got a phone call it's the first phone call that that came in and I go in there and I pick up the phone and it was coach Levy wow, at, wow. I mean at the time yeah, leading yeah. the bills to yeah. pretty right. you know, how crazy. awesome is that yeah, because you know crazy. back then there was no cell right. phones yet. Right, right 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 so he, he had called the PR office and they got me on the phone with him and he just wanted to congratulate me on such a great career and I said hey coach do you remember <laughs> I called you and said hey give me an opportunity to come back in and I just told him I said had you not made that decision to say hey right you know my life would be entirely different now so literally all the success that I've had in the National Football League is really a direct reflection of your ability to judge talent I guess and to give a young kid an opportunity. An opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so I never forgot that. Well, it's such a great example, Deron, that, um, you know, when people get knocked down or have choices that don't go the way they want to and you kind of get, you know, into a spot where you have to, like, make a decision, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, in our businesses, you know, we just call it, in a cool way, just being relentless, right? Yep. Looking for that yes. And you being relentless by making that phone call to coach, I mean, literally change the course of your life, yeah, right? And, and and not accepting no mm -hmm. for an answer, mm. you know. I mean, I could have easily accepted that piece of paper that said, hey, come in two days prior, but I knew some, something didn't feel right inside of me. So sometimes mm -hmm. when you feel like something's not right, you have to respond. And, um, you know, and that's all, you know, what we did throughout our career as, as football players, you know, you're always in a, in the pressure, right? Right. Because that game is always being filmed. They can see everything you do. It's true. You mm -hmm. can't hide out there as much as you want to. Right. You know, right. They're going to find you. You get judged. Out. Yeah. Right, yep. right. So, they, you know, the, the strategy in football is you go find the weakest link, right? And then you attack it. And, um, you know, and you can't hide. As much as you want to try to hide somebody's deficiencies, you can't hide mm -hmm. anybody's deficiencies. So when you get an opportunity, you got to be prepared. And I've always said this, um, it's um, all I was asking for was an opportunity. What we control as individuals, right, mm -hmm. is how we prepare to take advantage of those opportunities. Are we prepared physically, mentally to go out there and do it? Am I studying you know, am I the first one in, the last one to leave yep. at night? Yep. Am I totally prepared so that w each and every one of those guys, those ten other guys that are on the field with me, they understand that they know that I'm going to be where I'm supposed to be and that they can depend on me every single play. Right. And that, that was my goal, to make sure that they trusted me. And in the National Football League, that's what gets you on the field. That's what gets you the long career is if those coaches believe that they can trust you. Right. And if they can't trust you, then you're not going to have a, a long career in the league. When they feel like they can trust you mm -hmm. and that you're going to do everything and be consistent mm -hmm. every single day, then you'll have a long career in the league. Well, for those people yeah. listening, sorry to cut you off, you're DC, um, I think that that's a, a lesson across no matter what somebody's doing. So if you're listening to the show and, and you're, uh, you know, you're a teacher – or you're um, an amateur athlete, or you're running a, you know, you're working at a mortgage company, right? It doesn't matter if if the people around you, your team members, your leaders, if they trust you, if they know that you're going to battle every single day. We talk about this all the time with our team members. We've all got to row in the same direction. Mm -hmm. If one person starts going 
off sideways or starts reversing, then it's going to slow the entire operation down. So mm-hmm. I love what you're talking about. Like you're going to battle, and you need to know those other ten men and your coaches to know that you're out there and they can trust you, and you're not going to let them down. But I love right. the lesson across yeah. all platforms. Uh, it's such golden nuggets because it's just like what we talk about. you got to have all your team members on the same page, knowing that everyone's 100% all in, and they're just not half into it. Because I'm sure you probably saw this in your career. I'm sure you saw some young guys come up, and they were the absolute studs in elementary, junior high, high school, college, mm-hmm. and they relied on a lot of their talent. Then they hit the NFL, natural ability, yeah. right, and then hit the NFL, and you can't always rely on that because now you're surrounded by the best of the best, right? Oh yeah, and and you've got to have you got to have a good work ethic, but you got to be willing to to be there alongside with your teammates, right? You mm-hmm. you've got to be able to show them that you're willing to work, and that in situations you can overcome adversity. That's the thing that people don't understand is. How do you overcome adversity? And when you mm-hmm. talk about you just made the point about guys that come in. I've seen guys that came in that were number one draft picks and couldn't make the team because, number one, they couldn't study. But, number two, when adversity hit them, mm. they didn't know how to respond because everything was easy so for easy. them. They never had it before. They never had it before. Right. So they lesson. didn't know how to react to it or whatever they were doing. I, I remember this. I, I mean, working out some days at Arrowhead Stadium, going in there, running them stadium steps <laughs> all the way around the stadium. And I couldn't get guys to go work out with me. In the right? middle of summer, in yeah. In the middle of summer, it's 100 mm-hmm. degrees, right? Yeah. And you know you got to go put that time in. Well, if you can't have enough motivation yourself to go put that time in, right? then what are you going to do? I could easily sat at home and, and, and say, oh, I'm not going to do it today because nobody wants to do it with me. Mm-hmm. But the, the measure of a guy is – what do you do when no nobody's looking? That's right. right. That's you got to exactly go in there right. and do it. And and I always felt that. So whenever I had success and I got named to Pro Bowls and all those things, you know, I always remember those hot days in July, right? And people say, okay, what do you remember? I said, I remember those hot days in July when nobody would go work out with me and I had to go do it myself. Yep. I had mm-hmm. to motivate myself to go do it. And you say, okay, what's the reward? Here's the reward. Right, right, exactly. That's the reward. That right. lesson goes with integrity, okay. yeah. right? Yeah. Integrity is doing the right thing even when no one's looking, right? Mm-hmm. It goes with your your drive to be the best at what you do. You're talking about running up those steps in the summertime. I've heard you tell that story before, and I've heard you mention somebody that did do it a couple of times with you named Paul Kaufman. Oh, yeah. And his son, Chase, was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. He's a buddy of ours. Yeah, and right. I've been talking with Paul this week, actually, about being on the on the mm-hmm. podcast. And would he go out there and do it as well? Yeah, I think, oh, yeah, yeah. Shoot. Hog was our – he was our leader, that guy. You talk about a workout yeah. fiend? Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. He used, to, he used to run our workouts. Literally, he wow. was a guy that we followed behind. I mean – and there's this big hill up behind um, Royal Stadium, and we used to run up that hill. Like kind of going towards FCA up there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's yeah. A, there's a, well, and it's more to the left of that, but mm-hmm. you're running up this hill, and I'm telling you, you, it was a, it was a gut-changing <laughs> deal. I mean, after about two or three times you're running up there, you don't want to go up there a fourth, a fifth, or a sixth time. Right. And, and Paul's sitting there, come on, guys, come on, let's go. You know, he he, cool. he would just go. So you you got to have guys like that that you respect, that are motivating. And, you know, it was good to be as a group because then you're all, like you said, you know, you're all rolling well, in the same yep. direction. Mm-hmm. And you, you're all, you know, got something at stake there. So when you're out on that field, when the season comes, you can look at a guy that's next to you, next to you, and you know that he's in the same mindset because he did the same thing, mm-hmm. right? You know, he prepared, right. Right. so you know he's ready to go. So. Right, and I'm sure that gives everyone on that side of the ball just more confidence. Like, hey, we're, we're, we're all ready to together. rock right. and roll, yeah. man. That's Let's right. go. That's we're in right. this. We're in this battle together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, literally, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you kind of mentioned earlier before we went on, Bobby. You know, if uh, a little bit different choices of. Uh, Quarterback choices in the draft in the eighties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. let's talk. You know, I don't. Yeah. Hey, yeah. anytime right? I can talk about this, this is cool. You know, we were talking before the, the episode started. Just teed up for me. Yeah, I mean, like, 
rowing in the same direction. It, it goes for the players. It goes for the front office. It goes for all leadership of all organizations. And I, I don't know that the the uh, leadership of the Chiefs was making decisions that helped row in the same yeah. direction right. in the early 80s when they passed on Dan Marino and took Todd Blackledge. Yeah, when right. that defense of the Chiefs was so incredibly strong for so long. Yep. And, you know, it didn't really have the offensive weapons to make sure that this team – I mean, what, like – four playoff appearances in your 10 yeah. years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like that's crazy to think that the talent that this team had. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, I look back at those years and it just goes to show you that, um, you know, having the right type of people in the right positions mm. makes a big difference. And we didn't really have, I would say the good solid football minds that you really need. Until Carl Peterson came right. and things changed, changed a lot. And they, right. they brung in Marty Schottenheimer, who had you know a sec- successful career at, at Cleveland, Cleveland as a head coach. So you offered that stability, and that's when the Chiefs kind of changed the whole atmosphere at Arrowhead. Changed during that that time frame because you had football people, knowledgeable football people, making good football decisions, mm-hmm. and they weren't afraid to you know, make the decisions that impacted you. And and you think about it, you know, that draft of Ty Blackledge set the organization back, back. 10, at least decade 12 easy, years yeah. because you were never really in a position to get the number one pick and draft a guy. Or mm-hmm. if you were in position to draft the number one pick, there was never a quarterback that mm-hmm. was available right. other than that one class mm-hmm. that they could have taken Marino. And, um, and I think everybody sit back and go, man, why didn't you take Marino? Could you imagine with our defense and having oh. him? Man, you oh, could have. You know, there, there could have been championship banners lined up. Yep, for real. That would have been good Absolutely. for him too. So, so t- <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. he didn't win any right. with my team. So, so all I think about is you know, the draft is an inexact science, right? Yeah. You, you've got some, you know, and, and we look back and thank goodness that you know we drafted Mahomes when we did, and we didn't, mm-hmm. you know, the Bears passed on Trubisky, and we didn't uh, draft Deshaun Watson. I mean, it's there's mm-hmm. a little bit of luck in there. So, thank goodness that worked out. But going back a little bit, talk about. What was the attitude and mindset change when Marty came in to Kansas City? Well, I, I was I was lucky because I I knew who Marty was. It wasn't like I didn't have a, a an understanding of how he coached because he was my coach in like two Pro Bowls. Oh yeah, um, okay. And so I knew he was tough. Um, you know, in the Pro Bowl, you know, you go over there and. You know, they say it's a week of fun, right? You're enjoying it. And back then, back then, Hawaii, you know, the game, yeah. the game meant mm-hmm. something. You know, guys played. It's not like today where it's two hand touch. And right. You don't even know. Nobody what goes. Game is. Nobody yeah. goes. You don't even know what the game is. But you know, back then, you know, you you really played because it was at the end of the season. It was the last game, and you know, so you really put a lot of effort into it. And I think those coaches, other than, you know, the trip over there, they were getting a little bit of extra money, so they wanted to win. Mm-hmm. And uh, Marty was that way. I mean, he he had us in pads every day. At the Pro Bowl? At the Pro Bowl. He had us <laughs> in pads relentless. every Never day. relax. Never and, uh, you know, guys would be upset. And I remember one year, the year that the, uh, the Raiders beat them, and it was always the, the team that lost the AFC Championship game. Their staff went mm-hmm. to the Pro Bowl, so – the Raiders beat them. The Raiders wind up winning the Super Bowl that year. So, you know, Marty was a coach, and I'll never forget that it was on a Friday, and um, you know, the NFC. Those guys were in shorts every day. They, you know, they had a one-hour practice or whatever, and Marty had us out there for like two hours. This is Marty's so, own personal Super yeah. Bowl. Yeah. And so I remember uh, it was a Friday. I think it was a Friday or Saturday morning practice, and he was still having us in pads. And so I think Marcus Allen um, kind of did a revolt and told everybody, "Hey, don't bring your pads today." You know, <laughs> I think it was Friday's <laughs> practice. Don't bring your pads. So nobody shows up. We get off the bus. We're going to practice over at the University of Hawaii, and um, we get off the bus. Nobody's got their pads. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. Man, I tell you what. Did he lose his stuff? You could, as red as that jersey is right there. <laughs> that's how red Marty's face was when everybody walked off that wow, bus. Wow, I bet. And didn't have pads on. And he just like, you know, you could just tell he was. But we won. Both the times I was winning, we won. <laughs> that's right? awesome. We won the game. But he was a very intense guy. So I knew we were getting an intense coach. And. You know, the guy that, you know, he had a system that he wanted to play. Mm-hmm. Yep. That was his system. The, the the one thing about Marty, he was very stubborn. He he, what? he believed in a certain way to doing things, mm-hmm. and that was the way. And the Marty Ball. Way, and yeah. But he was he was the leader, though. He right? was. And, and I'll tell you a story. When, when he was in Cleveland, um, you know, I was in Kansas City. They were playing the Broncos uh, in a game, and so he called – he called the stadium one day. I was in watching film. It was like 6 o'clock at night, believe it or not. And uh, the trainer comes in the film room and gets me and says, hey, you got a phone call, Tom Pratt. And I'm going, like, Tom Pratt? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, okay, Tom Pratt. He's the defensive line coach for Cleveland. So I go mm-hmm. into the training room and I get – because Tom used to coach here yeah. years ago. Yeah. So he knew Dave Kendall, who was the, the head trainer at the time. So I go in there, pick up the phone, and I said, hello. And Tom goes, uh, Duran? I go, yeah. He goes, this is Tom Pratt. He goes, hey, I got a, um, I got a, uh, Marty wants to talk to you. And I go, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so okay. Marty gets on the phone. He starts asking me questions. Okay, uh, we're playing Denver this week. What, what do you guys do? I'm watching film. You guys always seem to confuse him. What? what this is what, when he's coaching Cleveland. This is, this is when he's coaching yeah. Cleveland, and he's asking me. He goes, "Okay, what do you what do you do?" And and I go, "Well, I said first of all, I said most people give Elway a little too much credit that he can read defenses." And I said our game plan going in there is just to, you know, disguise our coverages against him because he doesn't read defenses very good. Very good. What's good about Elway is he ad libs. And okay. when the pocket breaks down, what happens is mm-hmm. people lose their receivers, and he's so talented and he has the arm strength, he can throw the ball a country mile. That's where he gets you. But mm-hmm. literally, if you're able to confuse him, give him different reads at a pre-snap and make him work, you got an opportunity to be successful. And that's why we were always very successful early in the games. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we were leading them going into the mm-hmm. fourth quarter. Right. Then all of a sudden he comes brings oh, his yeah. team back because yep. he's seen just everything sling already and yep. he's just slinging it. So but I, I told him that and you know, they wind up winning, beating them that game they, as success. So wow. I was like, okay, so we gave away all our trade secrets, you know. Yep. But um yeah, I think that's the only time you know, Marty would would have said that he called a player to get some advice on playing against another team. So. Now, did, now, did he send like a, a big thing of barbecue no, or a big thank you? For no, that? no, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't give me anything. But you know but, what? So we uh, we had JJ Burden on the show a couple of weeks ago, okay. and uh, just I mean, first of all, like you, just a sweetheart of a guy. Just salt of the earth, Phenomenal. such a great yeah. heart and a great business leader yeah. and a motivational guy, motivating guy. Uh, he had a lot of Marty stories too, but he credits his entire career. Like what Marv Levy was to you mm-hmm. was Marty to JJ mm-hmm. because he drafted he, him in Cleveland. Yep. yep, he just believed in him. And brought him back to Kansas City when nobody else was, was giving him a shot because mm-hmm. I think JJ got hurt really early in his career. Or yeah. The Browns cut him. Well, very similar story to where they brought JJ back, didn't have a spot for him. Yeah, that's right. He ended up being Sent in a, him home. Ended up being in an apartment with someone, and they gave him some meal money for a week yeah, or two. And then when right. a spot opened back up, oh no, Marty, Marty, at the meeting when Marty told him that he had to go home, gave him cash, took out his wallet, gave JJ two hundred bucks, and said, "Will this keep you in town if you take your wife to dinner?" Because I don't want you to leave town in case we we can bring you back. Have you heard this story? I hadn't heard that. Yeah, story. and so yep. at the meeting between Marty and JJ, Marty pulls out his wallet and says, two hundred bucks. Will that let you stay in town for another night and keep, take your, your wife to dinner?" And JJ said, "Hell yeah!" Yeah. So he took his wife to dinner. He stayed in town, and then Marty brought him back. Yeah, 
That's right. pretty cool. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, we want to be respectful of time. Yes. So let's maybe focus a little bit and talk about some of the, the, yep. the post-football stuff. So, exactly. Uh, which, by the way, great stories. So mm-hmm. thank you for sharing some of those. Um, you know, one in particular that I've been the most exposed to um, is Score One for Health. And we know that, that many children in the Kansas City area – you know, don't receive the health care that they need or deserve. And, and that's really where Score One for Health has come in. And the program focuses on reaching children, um, you know, with comprehensive health screenings um, while keeping them, you know, safe and easy. But the thing about it, that they do it is you do it in schools, right? Right, where it's the most mm-hmm. accessible for families. So maybe talk a little bit about um, what this does for elementary aged kids and why it's important and, and why you've chose to focus so much time and energy and resources on this particular avenue? Well, uh, it goes back to um, my uh, childhood um, being in a community that was close, close knit. And there was a janitor at our high school, Mr. Mm-hmm. Merle Pratt. I talk about him all the time because he, he was such an inspiration to us young kids. He would always open up the gym and give us an mm-hmm, opportunity to play mm-hmm. and keep us off the streets and keep us um, in a positive light, knowing that once we left, he was going to have to clean that gym all over again. <laughs> right. And so he's not getting home till after midnight sometimes, and he never said no. Wow. Anytime we asked, hey, Mr. Pratt, can we come over? Because we had two gyms at the high school. One was an older gym and mm-hmm. then a newer gym, and he would always – we were in one or the other playing basketball. So I, I never forgot that. And I thought that if I ever got in a position to help people, that that's what I would do. So I met a guy by the name of Bob Ritchie. And Mr. Dr. Ritchie was a, a radiologist, had graduated from KC University downtown, the mm-hmm. osteopathic uh, college. Uh, he was on their board and approached me after my career was ending and said, hey, we want to do something similar to what Len Dawson is doing at Truman Medical Center, raising money for the foundation, the hospital foundation. And this was at Park Lane Hospital Medical okay. Center in Raytown. Okay. And he says, hey, would you be interested in hosting a golf tournament to raise some money? And I said, yeah, I'd be interested, but I want to make sure we, we do something that's going to be impactful to kids. Right. And so one day I was watching a program on Channel 5 TV, and it was a little girl. They were getting ready to put her into a special ed environment, learning disability, mm-hmm. and they found out that she had a, it was like a rare eye defect, but it was correctable with mm-hmm. just a pair of glasses. Hmm. And so yeah. they showed her afterwards, and they showed us like this whole new world opened up to her. When she got wow. her glasses. When she got yeah. her glasses. Uh-huh. Like she, she could read, she could understand. It was like a new person. See emotion on people's right. faces. Yeah. Like, right. And I said to myself at that point, point in time how many more of our kids are in school that have some issues and it's going undetected and they're being mislabeled and they don't have the resources right, to go in because and at fix that it, time right? you know most of the medical people like most of the schools had school nurses the school districts were cutting back on school nurses school nurses mm. because of their budgets mm. and so those people were getting out of school so i said why don't we just go in and do these health screenings in the school? And at the time, we started with one school. We had one nurse that we had hired, and we'd go in and do these screenings. And I'd go in and do assembly and talk to the kids. And the first school we went into was 250 kids. We went in, we took toothbrush and toothpaste and passed it out. Mm -hmm. And after we got done, we did an assembly. We got done. I'd walk in the principal's office and... uh, this guy's got tears in his eyes. Wow. And he's going, Duran, you don't understand. This was in Raytown. And he goes, you know, some of our kids, they've never seen this. They they don't know what a toothbrush or a toothpaste is. Wow. Right? And you would think that everybody knows. He goes, no, mm-hmm. we've been asking for stuff like this. So mm. we wind up starting there and then expanding the program. And then we got the university to offer some support with their student doctors become Mm. part of their curriculum that they do this every single year and then we've gone from 250 to where we're screening you know over 14,000 kids a year Wow! and the object for me is to make sure that these kids understand 
what it feels like to be healthy as they start their career in education because mm -hmm. the greatest equalizer we can give those kids is an opportunity to get educated, mm -hmm. right? And they can't get educated if they're not healthy. Right. And so regardless of their social economic background, education is the greatest equalizer that I know and that my parents taught me about because right. they were all educators. Mm -hmm. So I thought that this would be a great opportunity for us to change the lives of people regardless of where they come from at least give them a good start on their educational career by being healthy. So that's how we start. Well, and not, amazing. not only that, Duran, that's just a truly amazing story, but you're building up the kids' confidence right. in themselves, right? You know, even though it's a toothbrush, tooth, but you're, you're yeah. building those young minds up. Yeah, and, and the other thing you're doing is, you know, we're getting them in front of these kids who are studying to be doctors, and so you're putting a whole different set of role models in mm -hmm. front of them. And we wanted them to see that, hey, this is what you can become if you work hard and study hard, but you're healthy. And you know what it feels like to be healthy. And just to see these kids that go through, you know, because we go into these schools and we set up basically a clinic. And they get their mm -hmm. vision, hearing, dental, total body assessment tests, blood pressure, you know, um, just everything. They check everything out. A lot of attention that they would never otherwise right. get. And right. some of them would never get this opportunity to get the medical attention right. mm -hmm. without, you know, this program. And so they have their folders and they get a check mark and they're so excited to yeah. see that. Right. And you have these doctors that are interacting with them. It's just an amazing program and it's it's done some really, really unbelievable work. Um, and, and it does help us as a community where you can take costs out of the system where you can get these mm -hmm. kids help, right. preventative help, before mm -hmm. it becomes something that costs you thousands and thousands of dollars in mm -hmm. surgery. So we're, we're, we're real grateful and blessed to be able to have that partnership with Kansas City University and, um, and all the volunteers that provide that opportunity for these kids to get their screening. So before we forget, because we always want to get like this phenomenal word out to people, so where can people go to be able to help with, with this cause, Duran? So if they go online to DuranCherryFoundation.org, uh, okay. there's a list of everything mm -hmm. in there, all the charities we support. There's even a link to donation yep. if you want to volunteer. We have our annual fundraiser coming up. Uh, we have our big tailgate party on September 24th yep. at, uh, at my place of business, United Beverage Company. And then on that Monday and Tuesday following that, I think it's 26th and 27th, mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. our golf tournament. We're, we're breaking it out into two days this year. So we'll have a group on Monday and another group That's on amazing. Tuesday. That's nice. amazing. Because so, you have so many people right. that want to help right, out. Right. So good. And so we still have um, opportunities if you want to sponsor, if you want to volunteer, if you want to, you know, donate to the cause. Uh, there's 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 teams still available. If you want to put in a team, they're still okay. available. Um, so we would love your support. Um, this is for a great cause. Not only do we work with the kids at Score One for Health, but mm -hmm. Camp, camp quality, quality is another one of our right. charities that we send these kids to camp for a week. We also work with, in Raytown, the Midwest Animal Rescue, mm -hmm. which has been phenomenal. And then a guy that you guys know very well, Ronnie Dumit, mm -hmm. has answered the call. Um, he's one of our recipients of, uh, of the funds, too, because we want to support our first responders, those folks Always. that are Absolutely. on the front line for us on a daily basis. My brother was a, a police officer for a number of years, so it's something that's near and dear to me. Mm -hmm. And we want to continue to support our people that that support us at each and every day. That's awesome. Yeah. Again, that's the Duran. Right. It's DuranCherryFoundation dot org. We can find. I was just on there this morning. It's you guys have made it so easy for people right. to be able to assist. Like literally, Tempo. click of a button. Donate here. Donate here. Right. You get it. Yeah, it's all tax deductible. So it's yeah. it's a very very easy. And you get a chance to see all the people who support us, all the sponsors yep. who have. Uh, you know, been with us for years. This is our this is our thirtieth year. That's amazing. So that's it's, that's I crazy. Mean, it's crazy to me to think thirty years. I was my first one was that one. Yeah. 
the twentieth because I've got that mug, you know, yeah, and the shirts yeah, and everything. Yeah. So I was right. looking at that. I'm like, I can't believe it's been ten years. Old. I can't yeah. believe you started that when you're at eighteen years old. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I got a birthday coming up too. So yeah. that's awesome. Oh, that's right. Well, before yes. before we wrap up here, there's a couple of opportunities for stories that I'd like to hear. One personally that I am I did not know until we did our research, but you were a driving force to bring the expansion team, the Jacksonville Jaguars, into the NFL. Can you just talk for a few minutes about how that happened? And, I mean, what the heck? That's awesome. It was just a crazy opportunity for me. Uh, One of my guys, uh, a friend of mine who's a Budweiser distributor in um, Kansas, Pat Scherzer, a guy, rest his soul, he passed away. But um, he was friends with uh, Wayne Weaver, who was our majority owner. Him and Wayne were neighbors down at the Lake of the Ozarks. They had houses because Wayne originally was from St. Louis and uh, owned a company called, um, I believe at the time it was Brown Shoes. And uh, okay. And then um, he wound up purchasing Liz Claiborne's shoe line and uh, wow. started Carnival Shoes. And so he made a lot of money in the shoe business, believe it <laughs> or not. Yeah. And, um, and he wanted to be an owner in the National Football League. So... Uh, at the time, the league was putting a huge premium on minority ownership. And so he called Pat and said, Pat, who do you know? And he goes, well, I know Deron Cherry and Bo Jackson. He goes, I don't want to deal with Bo Jackson. <laughs> let me – let me, let I'll me, call Deron. Let me call Deron. So he, he got us in touch, set up a meeting, and um, – and we met at Grozo's downtown. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And had, had dinner. And he says, hey, I'd like you to be a, a, a part of what we're doing in Jacksonville. And I said, okay, let me do, let me do some research. I'll get back to you. So I picked up the phone. And at the time, um, um, Paul Tagliabue was a commissioner, mm-hmm. but his assistant mm-hmm. was Roger Goodell. And yep. I had been long-term friend, long-time friends with Roger from when I – first went to the Pro Bowl, he was kind of a guy that went around and asked me if, you know, I'd go do appearances and stuff like that. So we got Mm. to be good friends. And um, so I called Roger and said, hey, tell me about Wayne Weaver. You know, what what about Jacksonville? Tell me about it. He goes, well, he goes, I can tell you that ownership likes him and I think he'll be an owner one day. And, you know, I said, he goes, well, if, you know, I can't guarantee you that you guys are going to get a team, and mm-hmm. but the owners like him. So I, so I called Wayne back and said, yeah, I'd be interested in being a partner with you. And it was just, um, you know, so I got him in touch with Lamar, and uh, Lamar talked to him, and uh, we had a great conversation. And if you remember the first time we went to Chicago for the vote, um, I was up against uh, Walter Payton. Oh, because wow. Because Walter Payton was – with the group in St. Louis. Okay. So we didn't know if Jacksonville even had a shot because we knew Carolina was going to mm-hmm. be there because they wanted to be in the southeast because there was such a void between, mm-hmm. you know, Atlanta and, right. you know, Baltimore. That's such I a guess. huge college football right. mecca out there. It's a huge area. So they wanted to be there. And then the, the other deal was St. Louis, one of the larger markets. Uh, they wanted to get a team back there. And so they had an ownership group that, you know, it was Jerry Clinton, who was a Budweiser, largest Budweiser distributor in the state of Missouri. Mm-hmm. Uh, J- James Northwine, who was with a, a partner in New England, but decided he wanted to move because he was involved mm. with Anheuser-Busch in St. Mm. Louis, right. was one of their big shareholders. And then they had Walter Payton. And for some reason, that deal fell through. Orthwine went out. Uh, Jerry Clinton wanted to be the, the main guy. And it just fell apart right at the last minute, right as we were going to Chicago. So Hmm. they kind of bought in another guy who was Stan Kroenke at the time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he had no idea what was going on. So they get in the meeting, and it was just like, wow, we we can't pick St. Louis. So Mm -hmm. they actually chose one team, and that was Carolina. And then they said, hey, we're going to come back in a month and have another vote on St. Louis and Jacksonville. For the second team. For the second team. And we went back to Jacksonville and, you know, we actually put together a program where we sold like 10,000 club level seats in 10 days and was guaranteeing the largest uh, payday for visiting team gate in the National Football League. Mm, that typically helps. Right. With <laughs> the makes, other owners. makes friends. Right. Yes. Yeah. Which so, was brilliant. So who, who came up with that plan? So, the, so 
we, we, we had some really smart people on our team. There's a guy by the name of David Selden, and he was a guy that graduated from Wharton School of Business. He was, he was like a pri- child prodigy, mm-hmm. just smart with numbers and everything. Came up with that idea, and um, the rest was history. And so when we came back 30 days after that, um, we wind up, uh, you know, they made the announcement that Jacksonville would be the 32nd team. And I'll never forget this. And we're standing outside in this lobby area, and the commissioner walks out and says, you know, we, we've chosen Jacksonville as a team. And I'm like, I was stunned. <laughs> it's Literally, happening, I was right? stunned. It's happening, and we're going to, you know, now I'm going from player to owner in the league mm-hmm. and um, the first minority owner even before Walter right. Payton. And yeah. he was, I mean, and so when I turned around, you know, I could see, I could feel somebody was behind me and I couldn't, you know, I, I'm, I'm just so excited, turn around and behind me is Lamar Hunt. No He's way, he right was there. Me. He was there. He's standing right behind me. It's like he... You know, he knew it was happening. He just wanted to kind of see my response, and we we both hugged. And he's like, "Congratulations!" And you know, I'm so happy for you. And, That's special. And so, to me, I'll never forget that because um, you know he helped so much, and he was just always so gracious to. And, and, and it's true, the Chiefs are family. Yeah. And that's that's kind of the way I look at it. So. Um, it's just an amazing – it was an amazing experience, an mm-hmm. amazing time to be involved with the NFL as, you know, a player. You know, you come from a free agent punter to an all-pro safety <laughs> to an owner in the National Football it's, it's the, just, the path is pretty you incredible. Can't, you can't write that, that book fast enough, right, right, to talk about that. So, That's a yeah. pretty amazing story. It is. It, it, it is. really is. And, and to have the support of the Hunt family, Yeah, I, I don't think a lot of people realize – how big an impact oh, yeah. and, and how fortunate yeah. we were in Kansas City to have yeah. that family. So And we yeah. still do. I mean, yeah. and that legacy has continued on. Clark is, you know, a chip off the old block. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they, it's, we're, we're so lucky that we got a, an ownership like that. They're probably one the best ownership in, cool. in yeah. the National Football League. Hands down. That's amazing stuff, yeah. Duran. Well, Duran, Cherry, thank you so much for your time. We yes. we're, want to be respectful of your time. We'd also be remiss if we didn't mention um, the passing of, of a great Kansas City Chief yesterday, That's Lenny right. the Cool Dawson. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, to honor him, and, and I know that you were you were pretty close with him. Yeah, Lenny, uh, man, I tell you what, that that was hard. We used to we used to get together at Indian Hills. There's a group of us that would have lunch, you know, at least a couple times a year, and so it was fun to get together and talk with Lenny and the old stories. So. It, you know, we still have that with our Chiefs and Bachelor group. Mm-hmm. At least we together, right. and that's part of what Lamar's legacy is, that to have the mm-hmm. alumni still be part of the family. You know, um, you know when the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, you know, they gave all the ambassadors rings, too, as well. So that's special. It that's just awesome. goes to show you just how first class that organization For sure. Is. For that's sure. That's fantastic. And they never forget the guys that paved the way. Right. For, that's for that's this. the best part yeah. for sure. Um, we'll wrap up here. I've got two stat lines. First, NFL safety. 11 seasons, 50 interceptions, six consecutive Pro Bowls, five-time mm. first team – or five-time All-Pro, second safety, seven seasons, 32 interceptions, five Pro Bowls, only three first-team All-Pros – the second guy, Kenny Easley, is in the NFL Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. First guy is Drawn Cherry. Yeah. And he should be in the hey, Hall of Fame. All day long. <laughs> all day long. Absolutely. I know I, you're a very, very humble person. Yeah. But yes. when I, that really stood out to me that that, right. that guy is in and mm-hmm. one is the is not. And mm-hmm. Anyway, Drawn, yeah. it's an honor and a privilege to have you here today. Yes. Thank you for having yeah. me. Thank you so much. It. You did an amazing job. Thank you for all the gold nuggets you dropped. Yep. And just. Yeah. All your foundations, man. Like you said, what an absolute story. Well, Absolutely. There's, there's a lot more gold nuggets, so maybe one of these days you'll have me back in. Uh, we'd love that. We'd love that, guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, we'll thank you that. so much. Make sure you check out DuranCherryFoundation.org where you can donate to any of his organizations that he is passionate about, Score One for Health, Camp Quality, of course, our buddies over at Answering the Call and the Midwest Animal Rescue. Guys, this has been the Always Be Cool podcast. Find us online where you can download and stream all podcasts at Google, Apple, and Spotify, as well as Instagram and Facebook at Always Be Cool Podcast. Guys, Duran Cherry in the house. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Duran. See you, guys. Take care.